You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. It's only a kick, a jump, a block. It's only a serve. It's only a tackle, a run. It's only for the fans. After all, it's only pressure. You got this. Adidas. Why take one vacation with the family when you could take all of them? With Royal Caribbean, you don't just go to the beach. You visit a private island and race down the tallest water slide in North America. You don't just go for a road trip. You ATV and zip line through the jungle. You don't just go somewhere new. You rappel down waterfalls and discover ancient temples. Because this isn't just any vacation. This is all the vacations. Come seek the Royal Caribbean. Ships Registry, Bahamas. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident fanalist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore data. Well, we should start off today's program talking about today's football game. I know, who gives a crap? I get it. Kansas City Chiefs are going to beat the living daylights out of the Denver Broncos. Well, I figured we'd talk about it um, because we're facing the Broncos and just because. So Denver right now, our soon-to-be opponent, is 1-4. and four. Their only win came on the road against the Chicago Bears in that pretty amazing comeback victory. Um, they're, they're really not the worst offense in the world. It's just that their defense has completely fallen off. They, they scored 33 points against Washington and lost. They scored 31 points in that win over Chicago. Otherwise, it's 21-20 and 20 the last... Uh, as far as the last four overall games, 33-20, 31-21. It's a top 10 offense in terms of scoring, but dead last in points, dead last in yards. They gave up, obviously, the 70s, a big one, but again, leaving out week one, which is a bit of an anomaly offensively and defensively, they gave up 35, 70, 28, and 31. And now they're going up against the Kansas City Chiefs, which are not exactly slouches, at least historically which is part of what's interesting about this game, is they actually rank ninth, just a little bit ahead of Denver offensively. The other interesting thing is they actually face the Chiefs before and after the Green Bay Packers. So it's Kansas City, Green Bay, Kansas City is what they have on their schedule. I don't know if that's positive or negative. It may end up being positive. If Kansas City can do what Kansas City does, they got to go on the road. They're going to get the crap beat out of them. They're going to be slightly demoralized. They're going to have a Green Bay Packers team that they're probably going to underestimate, and they're going to be looking past them as they want to try to get revenge on Kansas City, which they know isn't going to happen, but that's going to be the big thing. That's the rival. That's the team they don't want to face. they got to face Kansas City, so who knows? Maybe we kind of catch them sleeping and give them the old knockout blow. Um, As far as the model that... um, that I have for score predictions. I've got Kansas City winning by a little over 15 points. I've got it, let's call it 35 to 20. So no real question there. The the only question is from a betting standpoint, would you want to touch this game? Well, just based on that, the Kansas City Chiefs are 10 and a half point favorites. I've got them at 15 and a half. Seems like an easy bet. However, it's worth noting that Kansas City has beat Denver the last 15 times in a row. The last time that um, Denver actually beat the Kansas City Chiefs was September 17th, 2015. However, the Kansas City Chiefs have not covered the spread the last three meetings. They haven't, they, they've done it um, once out of the last five, which is to say Vegas sort of overestimates the firepower of the Kansas City Chiefs against the Denver Broncos and maybe underestimates the whole divisional thing. So the most likely outcome, seemingly based on history, is Chiefs win but don't cover the spread. So for that reason, I'm a little bit nervous. I should be betting the Chiefs against the spread, and I may still, just to kind of see if it pays out or if I should have paid more attention to the historical aspects. But that's kind of where we're sitting. Plus, it's Thursday. I should look at that too. Not a ton to take away from that, honestly. Chiefs are 57% uh, straight up, 55% against the spread, and 55% uh, on the over. 
However, the Denver Broncos are 62% straight up on Thursday, 57% against the spread. So they will just kind of say they cancel each other out and are generally under. So anyways, it'll be worth keeping an eye on. Obviously, any injuries are going to be worth noting. Not rooting for, just noting. And I guess we're rooting for the Chiefs, which I don't generally like doing. But if the Denver Broncos put up a fight, I'm going to cry. All right, that's enough of that. I did want to mention something else. I just got done kind of going through, I've got to do my show with Matt Ramage, kind of going through some of these picks and whatnot. And several teams are coming off of buys, and I wanted to see how teams did. And one pattern that I noticed is that teams kind of suck coming out of a buy. I don't know what this thing is where we assume that because they're rested or whatever, they're going to be good. It's just not really a thing. Everybody that I looked at, at least, was worse in terms of their record, and especially against the spread coming out of the buy, than just generally speaking. The Packers, I have generally noted, are not very good coming out of a buy. That is, however, not necessarily the case so much anymore, right? I mean, this all started in 2019 against San Francisco. We got blown out 37 to 8. We were three-point underdogs and lost by basically 30 points. Then the very next year, we go up against Tampa. We're three-point favorites and lose 38 to 10. And so that kind of sparks on top of bye weeks after going into the playoffs and things like that that kind of give you this thought that maybe the Packers aren't very good coming out of a bye. That was followed by 2021. Now, the Packers were 11 and a half point favorites, but still, they were 11 and a half point favorites against Chicago and won 45 to 30. Then last year, they were against the LA Rams, seven point favorites, and beat them 24 to 12. So they actually not only beat them, but they covered the spread, which is to say they, they over exceeded expectations and they were pretty lofty expectations. Now, the Packers are just 1.5 point favorites in this game, but, you know, again, you're coming, you're coming off a of bye week. You're 2-0 the last two years coming out of a bye week. You're favorites. And to be fair, what the, of the two losses, they weren't favorites in one of them. So of the times that they were favorites, they're 2-1. and one. And depending on what happens against the Denver Broncos and some of the reports that are going to be coming out about Green Bay, Aaron Jones is healthy, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, I'm assuming the market already kind of expects these things. But it's possible that it moves even more and more in the favor of the Green Bay Packers. It could go the other way, too. I don't know. But... Um, it is in Denver, which is also worth noting because, I mean, the two losses were on the road. The two uh, two wins were at home. So we'll see. That, that, that also brings me to, though, while we're looking at it, I kind of wanted to do something that I, I've been looking forward to, but you can't really do it early in the season because there's not enough information. Usually what I would do prior to the games or whatever is when we look at matchups, you know, this team versus this team, I would ask the question, when does a team win and when does a team lose? And I thought, I should do that for the Green Bay Packers. Right? Where where are we at right now? Because we're we're two and three. And are there any patterns? Are there any things? Because, you know, right now it's kind of doom and gloom, but we want to try to understand the team, right? Okay, so we're two and three. Uh points wise, we rank fourteenth offensively, eighteenth defensively, twenty eighth in yards offensively, 17th in yards defensively. Okay, those are sort of the general statistics and whatnot. We've been through that. If you look at when the Packers win, there isn't much of a correlation in terms of offensively. We won when we scored 18 points. We won when we scored 38 points. We lost at 24, 20, and 13. Defensively, though, and this is sort of an unfortunate marker, the Packers are 2-3 and three when the defense holds the opponent to 20 points or less. I'm guessing that this is pretty standard. In fact, I can, I can give you that data right now. Teams win 75% of the time when that's the case. The unfortunate part is we are 0 for 2 when we score 25, when, when a team scores more than 20 points. So you kind of create a bar and say, what, what is the offense saying the defense needs to produce? And right now the offense is telling the defense, you got to keep them below 20. And that kind of sucks. It should not be that way. Another marker is yardage. And, and there's a very clear distinction here. Offensively, in the three losses, we had 285, 230, and 224. In the wins, 329 and 340. There's a huge gap between offensive production in our wins and offensive production in our losses. There's about a 40-yard gap from the highest amount of yards we got in our, in, in our losses and the lowest amount we got in a win. Same is true with passing yards. It's, it's about 35-yard difference. In our losses... 203, 175, and 140. And our wins, 235 and 245. Even rushing, there's some similarity there, although our highest rushing game was actually against the Raiders. Still, in games where we ran over 90 yards, we're 2-1. and one. Under 90 yards, 
we're 0 and 2. And then of course turnovers are a big one. We are 0 and 2 with multiple turnovers. We are 2 and 1 with one or less turnovers. I mean, I honestly think we can just completely summarize from that. The offensive production, both passing and rushing, and the turnovers. If we can generate more yardage, I know this sounds intuitive, but it isn't always this straightforward. The the difference between the wins and the losses was a productive offense that could move the ball and was careful with it. The losses is a team that cannot move the ball and is reckless. And it's a massive difference that we can see in terms of, man, this could be a really good football team, and dude, this team freaking sucks. But what about defensively? It's kind of similar. It's amazing the difference. I mean, our, our highest total yardage in a game was 340. In games in which our defense held teams to our highest yardage or less of 340, we're 2-1. and one. Two of our losses came with 401 total yards and 446 yards. Those are against the Lions and the Falcons. In games in which the defense can hold a team to under 400 yards, which, may I reiterate, is a massive amount of yards, we are 2-1. and one. Passing yards is somewhat similar. The two highest in terms of passing yards allowed, we lost under 190 yards passing, which is a really low number. Again, our pass defense is actually quite solid. We did win those two games. And then rushing, um, same thing. Games in which we allow more than 200 rushing yards, good freaking lord, we lost. Under 200 yards, if we can just keep them under 200, we're 2-1. and one. I mean, it's, it's kind of crazy to me how... Um, I mean, offensively and defensively, there's just there's a line. Three of those games are Chicago, L.A., and New Orleans. Two of those games are Detroit and Atlanta. Detroit and Atlanta were defensive failures. Chicago, L.A., and New Orleans, the defense did a good job, but against L.A., the offense was a disaster. And then turnovers, um, we had two turnovers against Chicago and one. We had one turnover against Atlanta and lost. We had one turnover against the Raiders, but we gave away three, so that was a negative two and lost. We had one turnover against the Detroit Lions, but they had we gave away two, so that was a negative one and we lost. And then New Orleans, we had no turnovers and we gave it away. That was also a negative one. So we have been negative in three games, and in those games we won one. We're positive in two and we won one of those. So the turnover differential hasn't been as impactful, although obviously there's a very good chance we win at least one of these games, Raiders, if we didn't have such a ridiculous turnover differential. So, yeah, I mean, I guess it's relatively obvious, but we've seen the offense that we need to see. It was against Chicago and it was against New Orleans. That's the offense we need to see. The defense we need to see is against New Orleans and LA, or excuse me, Las Vegas. Nobody ever wants to see what happened in Atlanta and Detroit ever again. It was offensive and defensive nonsense. Garbage. But we get our bye week, you get in the lab, you draw up some stuff offensively, defensively, you fly out to Denver, it's your get-right game, you put up 30 freaking points on offense and the defense holds it down, you get all excited, you get back in there, you get fired up, then we got Minnesota at home. That is a winnable game. It's another game to keep an eye on is Minnesota. They're playing Chicago. Now, this should be an easy game for Minnesota, but Minnesota keeps throwing games away. They just lost their number one wide receiver. In Chicago, for some reason, I know the defenses are bad, but still, you're scoring 30, 40 points in games. It's something to pay attention to. The Chicago may beat Minnesota, which isn't the worst thing in the world. Not that I want Minnesota getting a quarterback either. I mean, I heck, can you imagine Caleb Williams and Justin Jefferson? Good freaking Lord. I'm just saying, they lose to Chicago, that's a winnable game. The Rams are a winnable game. Pittsburgh is a winnable game. These are still, you know, I know some of us are ready to throw in the towel and and move on, and I understand this isn't the right team, but we said this wasn't the right team. We said that this wasn't good enough, and we said that there would be bumps and all these kinds of things. Fine. But here's the problem. If this season is a tank season and everything is horrible, that's a really bad situation because we got more problems than just maybe Jordan isn't the guy or maybe this, maybe that. We need to replace, because because as it stands right now, I'll tell you what, we'll take a break and I'll finish this thought. If you want to support me on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy. We'll be right back. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular. Exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. 
Why take one vacation with the family when you could take all of them? With Royal Caribbean, you don't just go to the beach. You visit a private island and race down the tallest water slide in North America. You don't just go for a road trip. You ATV and zip line through the jungle. You don't just go somewhere new. You rappel down waterfalls and discover ancient temples. Because this isn't just any vacation. This is all the vacations. Come seek the Royal Caribbean. Ships Registry, Bahamas. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. Hey there. Did you know Baker's always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Baker's app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Baker's today. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. So here is the thought process. As of right now, based on what happened against the Raiders, Packers fans, and and I'm not even necessarily saying this is wrong, but we now have to get rid of Matt LaFleur maybe probably Stenovich and pretty much the entire coaching staff on offense. We got to get rid of Jordan Love. We got to replace almost the entire offensive line. Aaron Jones is gone. We want A.J. Dillon gone. Tucker Craft is not good enough. Josiah DeGuara isn't good enough. We got nobody. On defense, Joe Barry is gone. His entire staff is gone. Kenny's going to be gone sooner than later. Preston, I don't know, maybe got a little bit of time left on him, but he's not good enough. The safeties need to be replaced. Jair's not good enough. You know what I mean? Like, everything is a freaking disaster right now. So as much as it's like, man, we could race to the front of the line and and get a pick, if if you get a number one pick, that's great, but at the cost of of having no football team, that's not good. What I want, and think about this, you know this too, because you felt a lot better when you thought we had a really good offensive line and some really good wide receivers and some tight ends with potential and a scary defense that maybe just needs a new coordinator. We all felt better about that situation. I understand we we maybe aren't going to be in reach of the quarterbacks if everything starts to click and we start winning a bunch of useless games against teams like Denver and freaking Pittsburgh and some other stupid, useless garbage teams, Carolina. We end up with the 10th pick in the draft and can't get this elite, this, that, or the other. I get that that sucks. But we all felt a lot better when we were just a couple players away. So again... Number one pick is great, but at what cost? Because now we got a quarterback that has no offensive line, no wide receivers, no tight ends, no running backs or running game to speak of, and a terrible defense that maybe can get fixed if we replace the coach. But that's a heck of a hefty price. And and we got to replace our coaching staff, offensive and defensive. We might have to replace our GM. I know that that's what most of or a lot of you want anyways. That's That's a massive cost that is not going to be fixed anytime soon. And I don't know that any of us should really be rooting for that. It is what it is. I mean, if that's the reality, then I guess fine. You know, if if we're going to win one more game or no more games this year, then I'm rooting for no more games. But I also don't want to overreact to a bad Raiders game. Let's give them the bye week. Let's see what they can come up with. Let's see what they can do on the road against a really, 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 really bad defense. Lowest points they've given up the last four weeks was against Chicago. They gave up 28 points. That's it. And again, how, how many things do we have right now that we genuinely know are just garbage without being hysterical, overreacting people. What's garbage right now? Is the offensive line garbage? It's struggled the last couple weeks, and many of us have even acknowledged that potentially there are some coaching and schematic issues. I mean, again, when you look at even the situations in terms of why are these things happening, number one, anomaly, right? Could just be a random occurrence. Number two, coaching. That's not a big deal if you get a new coach. Um, Number three, maybe the center is the problem in terms of, um, you know, line calls or the quarterback or whatever. 
These are fixable issues that don't require a complete overhaul and don't require us to sit here and say, this entire offensive line sucks. Zach Tom sucks. John Runyon sucks. Josh Meyer sucks. Elton Jenkins sucks. Rasheed Walker sucks. You know, the, the other problem is, and I mentioned this before, I think we like to cherry pick which offensive linemen are the problem, and we like to look at the two guys that nobody likes. But in reality, those are the two guys that did a good job last week. It was Rashid, it was Elton Jenkins, and it was Zach Tom that were the problem if you want to look at the offensive linemen that struggled the most. So, you know, again, we, we, we can't really cherry pick. If we're going to say burn it with fire, then we're looking directly at Zach Tom and burning him with fire. Do you want to get rid of Zach Tom, or do we want to give him time? Do we want to look at some other options? Do we want to look at maybe the coaching issues or the schematic issues or the line call issues or whatever the case may be? Are these fixable things that we can fix with the guys that we have, with uh, accepting that we probably need to replace Rasheed Walker? But as far as the guys that we have outside of that, is it possible, again, considering this was a top offensive line through the first three weeks, that we can make some tweaks to improve the offensive line play? I would say yes. Is it possible we can see a better version of Jordan Love? My confidence has taken a massive hit, but the answer is yes. There, there's sort of this, like, it's almost like we skipped over the middle part. In the beginning, it was really good, but really aggressive. And so there were a lot of issues with accuracy and whatnot. Then, it's like we pulled the offense way, 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 way back in terms of being conservative in hopes of helping Jordan so that he's completing more passes and doing these kinds of things. But then, like, the offensive line collapsed, and it's just, like, there was no middle ground where we dial it back a little bit where we kind of get into a little bit of a better rhythm with some simpler, easier, shorter passes, get him feeling good so we don't have to wait until the second half for him to kind of get into a rhythm. It just it, it just seems like things kind of got disjointed a little bit. Like there was a transition that didn't quite transition right. It's like when you're trying to change the gears on your bike and the chain falls off. That's kind of how it feels like it happened. Let's, let's get some protection. Let's find a middle ground with the offense that is not just run the ball screen pass, but is also not, hey, let's shoot 20 yarders. And Jordan has to play a big part in this as well. Jordan's got to calm down, slow down. The, the best part about Jordan Love has always been that he's really intelligent, that he's reading the defenses really well, that he's calm, he's poised, he's composed. His rhythm and his timing are really, really solid. And when that starts to break down, everything's gone because he's already got accuracy issues. So when you got bad decisions and bad accuracy and bad timing, things just completely devolve. So he's got to calm down. We do have to get him some more protection, but he's got to trust his protection and, and get back to just trusting your eyes and, and your reads and all that kind of stuff. This is fixable. I, I'm Again, my confidence is massively shaken, but this is where we have to head. It does start with protection, and then from there, Jordan's got to, he's got to step up, right? We, we, we can create an environment, but you got to step into that. We also really need the wide receivers to step up. We saw it early with guys like Romeo Dobbs and Jaden Reed kind of, I don't, I don't want to say necessarily bailing out Jordan. But, I mean, if, if Jordan put up a 50-50 ball, our guys were coming down with it. We need playmakers. We need guys that can just make stuff happen, that you can just trust in a moment that are going to do it. You got you got to have game breakers like like Christian Watson, not just on freaking reverses and end arounds or jet sweeps or whatever kind of garbage, but I'm talking like we saw against Philly, an 11-yard slant that goes to the house. Figure some stuff out. And again, Jordan, you got to step into that. If we got Christian open down the sideline, you got to hit it. It's got to be in rhythm, on time. And he needs to score on that play. Not He needs to stop and wait and wait and wait and catch it and then go down. The, the components are here. We just got to put it together. And it's, it's, it's really a combination between Matt LaFleur and Jordan Love. Matt LaFleur needs to correctly identify this stuff. What, do, what is it we need and how do we get there? And again, that absolutely starts with the offensive line because it's useless without it. We can't run. We can't pass because we can't protect our quarterback. It's useless. We might as well just give up. It starts up front. Once we fix that... We've got to identify what it is we need from our players and how do we get there. And then again, it's it's all up to Jordan at that point to step into that role and execute. And yes, the wide receivers have to actually run the routes, catch the passes, and, and do what they do after the, the play, not run to the same area of the field, not misunderstand routes and do all that kind of nonsense. That's not helping an already chaotic and dysfunctional environment. Not at all. I think, honestly, the, the message for the offense is calm down. Relax. We're, we're trying to do, and that's Matt LaFleur also, we're trying to do too much. We're trying to do too much. Like early on, Matt LaFleur's digging deep into his bag, and it was cool, and I think some of it would have worked if it was executed, but now it's just getting to be clunky, and it's getting to be ugly, and we're trying to be cute, and it's not working. We're, we're, we're trying to do like 400-level stuff, and we're not executing basic 
remedial level blocks. Just freaking calm down. Slow down. Relax. Let's not get cute with our blocking. Let's just block. We can build, like, I want to get there, but we're not there. Let's, again, slow down. Jordan, slow down Matt, slow down receivers and Musgrave and everybody else. Like, just freaking calm down. They look like they're just, you're trying to do too much. Again, you got Luke Musgrave, his, go, his job, run into the flat. He basically goes and runs an out route. Like, bro, flat, flat. Defensively, I don't, I don't honestly know. I mean, we've been begging Joe Barry to put his guys in better situations, and I just don't know that, that I necessarily expect that at that point, at this point. I mean, we need guys to execute, absolutely. We need better execution. We need, we need guys that can win against the run. But I, I, I just feel like there might be a ceiling in terms of what this team is able to do if Joe Barry isn't able to identify ways to, you know, put his guys in a position to succeed. Again, other teams have got nobody's creating chaos. And I feel like with the Packers, you've got the really good pass rushers who are really good at pass rushing. You got the run defenders run defending. You got the tacklers tackling, the coverers covering. And that's that's pretty much it. You know, it's like guys that are good at what they're good at are just they execute what they execute. There's no like overcoming deficiencies. Like we got a bunch of guys that primarily are pass rushers and not run defenders. So guess what our defense is good at and guess what our defense is not good at. Again, like when we run a you know, end around with Christian Watson. Half the defense is behind our line of scrimmage in five seconds. When they run it on us, there's nobody over there. There's nobody there. Why? Well, yeah, I mean, so there, there's one guy that should have read the keys and identified da 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 Bro, their entire defense was there. This isn't just like, well, uh, if everybody just won. Yeah, if everybody was just winning their matchups every single time, our defense would be better. That's great. We don't even need a defensive coordinator for that. We can just let the players go out and pick their own play. Like, just go out and beat a guy. You call the own play. Like, what, what purpose do you serve unless you're overcoming some of these things through schematic designs? So, you know, I, 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 again, I think our winners are going to win and our losers are going to lose, and that's just the way it's going to go. Rashawn is going to be a pass rusher. Hopefully, Devontae Wyatt continues to be a pass rusher. I don't expect any changes in terms of our run defense. It's just going to be a negative, um, even though we do have good linebackers that are actually quite solid at executing, I think, when given the opportunity, but um, just aren't and are also injured, which doesn't help. But... Um, yeah, I don't know. I I, I just want to continue to see guys do a good job. Like I'm 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 rooting for all of them. They're, I'm I'm a big fan of you know. I mean, Kenny's looking good at least in the beginning of of games. He's got like a sack in the first series every game so far. Like <laughs> I kind of made that up, but it feels like it. Wyatt's doing a good job pass rushing, and Rashawn's pass rushing, even though we never see him. Razul's having a good year, and the linebackers look good when they're healthy. And even the safeties. I mean, Rudy Ford is looking dominant. Savage is looking adequate at least. So I'm excited for them, but again, I just I think there's kind of a ceiling in terms of how good they're going to be, and it, it you know they're, they're only as good as their opponent, right? You play Chicago, terrible offense, they scored 20. Atlanta, pretty bad offense, but slightly better, they scored 25. Saints, bad offense, they scored 17. Lions, good offense, they scored 34. Raiders, putrid offense, they scored 17. Right? I mean, it's just if you face a bad offense, they're not going to score a lot of points. If you face a good offense, they're probably going to score a good amount of points. Just feels like that's kind of how it's going to go. And God forbid it's a team with a good run game. And we're in some pretty serious trouble there. But, I mean, that's that's it. I mean, Joe Barry made some tweaks last year. Um, I mean, it, for all the criticisms, whatever he did after the bye week, he, he identified some, some things that he could change, and he changed them, and things were a lot better. And so hopefully he's able to do something similar this year. Obviously things have changed once again. And so uh, hopefully give him that opportunity. Hopefully we see more Rashawn Gary. I mean, the fact that he's on a pitch count is just terrible. I mean, you know, you got these other premier pass rushers. They're basically never off the field. Like TJ Watt and Miles Garrett, they barely come off the field. Rashawn is like a third down guy. Like we barely see him. And I, I'm, I'm not trying to say rush him back, but that's a major difference for our defense compared to a lot of other defenses. I mean, Rashawn is the, the cornerstone of the defense, and he's never on the field. So... We need more Rashawn Gary. He needs to be the number one guy in snap counts. Then down the line is is Preston, and then the rest of the guys. But I also don't know if we're ever really going to do that because I don't. It's never really been that. I mean, even when Rashawn was healthy, it was you got your number one and number two, and they're out there 
you know, 60% of the time, but there's still this heavy rotation. And I understand the theory behind it in terms of like, we want them healthy. So that at the end of the game, we can unleash them or whatever. Packers, are, I mean, they do that with Aaron Jones. Maybe, maybe that's sort of the conservative nature that kind of pisses off fans. And, you know, maybe it's provided us a little bit of extra health, although clearly we're not seeing that. Aaron Jones and Rashawn Gary are both hurt. But other teams lean on their superstars, and it feels like the Packers protect them. Again, Rashawn is protected all year. Well, we got to, you know, he, he, he and Preston are out there the most, but it's still a ton of the other guys. Other teams, dude, Rashawn would never come off the field in Pittsburgh. Slight hyperbole, but really, I mean, it, you look at the snap counts of edge rushers. Um, TJ Watt. He has 300 snaps. That's compared to 293 for Alex Highsmith, and then it drops to 91 for Marcus Golden, 55 for Nick Herbig, and 4 for Miles Killebrew. So you got your number one, slightly behind him is a number two, and then fall off a freaking cliff is number three. Another massive drop, about 50% of that is number four. They don't rotate! They got the two guys and that's it. And the number one guy is the number one guy. The number two guy is the number two guy. The number three guy almost doesn't exist on the football team. In Green Bay right now, we have 229 for Preston, 163 for Kingsley, 128 for Lucas, 107 for Rashawn, 84 for Hollins. I mean, it's a much smoother line going down as opposed to what you see with other teams where it's, these are our pass rushers. Who's your backups? I don't know. I'll let you know when one of our guys tweaks his ankle. San Francisco. Who's the number one guy out there? Nick Bosa. How many snaps does he have? 219. After that, they have Cleland Furl, 160. I mean, it's just, I mean, Nick Bosa is the guy. Pass rushes, pass rush opportunities. Um, Nick Bosa, 160. After that, it's 126, 111, and then sub 80. It's Nick Bosa. Like, Nick Bosa's the guy. Nick Bosa's always out there. He doesn't come off the field, and very rarely will he come off the field, especially in pass rush situations. Again, I know Rashawn is hurt, but I also know that we don't do this, and we need to get back to it. We need to go back to Preston and Rashawn are our guys. And that's that's just the way it goes. Not a massively heavy rotation. It's it's these are our guys. Unless unless somebody else is better, but at the very least, Rashawn doesn't come off. You want to rotate Preston? Fine. Rashawn stays on the field. Well, he's not a good run defender. I don't give a crap. I don't care. He'll learn. And again, I fully understand it's because he's hurt. I get it. And I know he's gonna play more. My my only request though is when he's a full go, he's full go. Not, we're going to slowly... No, no, no. Doctor says he's good. He's good. He plays. He stays. Keep him on the field. Our team, our defense gets massively better in that case. If there's a deficiency with him as a run defender, fine. Supplement somewhere else. He's not going to come off the field just because he's not quite as good of a run defender as what? Kingsley and Igbari? Give a crap. No offense to Kingsley, but screw that. Keep your best players on the field as much as possible. He needs a breather? Cool. Take him off. Let him get a breather. Get him some water, let him snort some smelling salts or freaking cocaine, I don't care what it is, and get him back out on the field. Whatever it is kids are doing these days. So, I, as, as far as what is the number one thing I think that can help this defense, it's that. I mean, health across the board, obviously, is important. Getting Jair back healthy and, you know, losing Bakhtiari is massive. I mean, health is a major component, but if there's a number one thing that I would like to see. I want Rashawn Gary being the far and away number one pass rusher. Not just, yes, he happens to be the best. No, he's number one when you look at the stats and the snap counts. There shouldn't be any question. Oh, that guy's your best player. How do you know? Well, because he plays more than everybody else. Oh, okay, yeah, good good call. Makes sense, I suppose. Anyways, let's take a quick break. I want to come back and talk about some of the comments made by uh, quarterback, former Green Bay Packers quarterback, Kurt Benkert, uh, specifically kind of taking shots at coach Matt LaFleur. We will take a break. We'll be right back. Survivor 46 is here, and so is On Fire, the only official Survivor podcast, and we have a twist this season. The winner of Survivor 45, D. Valladares, will be joining us every week. We're going behind the scenes of the biggest moments, the how and the why things happen, and the strategy and analysis you can only get from someone like me, a Survivor winner. Listen to On Fire, the official Survivor podcast, wherever you get your podcast. This episode is brought to you by Hyperice, the leader in advanced warm-up and recovery technology. They have tons of innovative products, like Venom-heated wearables to help soothe sore back muscles, Normatec compression boots to speed up recovery and increase circulation, and Hypervolt massage guns to improve mobility. Loved by athletes like Naomi Osaka and Erling Holland. Try them yourself. 
Get 10% off your order with the code MOVE at hyperrice.com. This episode is brought to you by Pepsi Wild Cherry. Pepsi Wild Cherry is bursting with delicious cherry flavor and a sweet, crisp taste that gives you more to go wild for. Getting wild may look different these days, but whether it's opting for a solo Friday binge watch or a big night out, everyone can indulge in their wild side with Pepsi Wild Cherry, also available in Zero Sugar. So grab a Pepsi Wild Cherry and get wild. So I found this kind of interesting. Um, Kurt Bankert, and I I don't 100% know what to make of it, but he kind of lays out his thoughts with Matt LaFleur, and it sounds like there's some pretty bad blood there, which is a little surprising. I, I wouldn't think of any kind of controversy surrounding Matt LaFleur. He seems like such a vanilla, white bread, like nothing exciting, bland, boring person. I can't imagine somebody butting heads with him. But here is what Kurt Bankert wrote on Twitter. He says, I've gotten a lot of questions about my opinion slash experience with Matt LaFleur and will be very transparent on my comments of us quote-unquote butting heads. I'd never even heard of this before, but okay. I'll start by giving my honest opinion about the scheme. It's outdated, and there's a better way to play offense right now. I'm not going to go into full detail, but I talk about this stuff all the time in my reviews. Now, this is not the first time we've heard of this. First time I heard it was from Clayton, actually, talking about this particular scheme that we run and the fact that, yes, it's a variant of sort of the Shanahan tree, but it's, it's an outdated thing that is not really cutting edge right now. Okay, that's number one. He goes on to say, on a personal level, outside of football, our personalities couldn't have been more opposite. And when you spend countless hours with someone in a meeting room, you grow to know them. He says, my personality meshed really well with some other coaches and not so much with his. His personality, he means. Those coaches left and I was released soon after. Have you ever had a boss that you didn't vibe with? Same thing. Is what it is. People move on. Add to this, when you're in a quarterback room, regardless of position on the roster, you're expected to contribute and speak up, especially a room with Aaron Rodgers. If you think keeping opinion to, if you think keeping your opinion to yourself was an option, on scheme, play design, matchups, etc., good luck with that. I honestly don't even know what any of this means. Anyways, he says, so over a year of giving my point of view on how I see the game, offense, mixed in with the fact that I was doing a lot in the gaming media space while being a player, it was clear that I wasn't liked so much. So regardless of how well I felt I was playing, it didn't really matter. At the end of the day, I was a dispensable practice squad player. My perspective and conversation added in with my projects off the field weren't a fit for the head coach, even though it was appreciated by others. If you think players only get cut over performance or personal conduct issues, you may have forgotten that sometimes people just have different personalities that don't fit with the ones in charge. I'm sure some of you have experienced this before, and the NFL is no different. Look, that's his perspective. Honestly, aside from the first part where he talks about the scheme being outdated, I don't find any of this massively important or relevant. It honestly sounds a little bit, uh, I don't know. I mean, he, he seems like a genuinely happy guy, so I, I, I don't see this as his personality, but he just, it, it comes off as kind of petty. Like, oh, I was, I was playing well, but I got cut because he didn't like me. It's like my teacher gave me a bad grade because he doesn't like me. Bro, <laughs> nobody was shocked that Kurt Bankert got cut. There's no like, what? He was so good. I, I, I don't know. Maybe I, I, I think he's maybe taking things a little personal. It's not to say maybe Matt LaFleur didn't like him, and he flat out says he didn't like Matt LaFleur. So I don't know. Um, you know, I've, I've already kind of made similar comments in terms of it. it does, you know, when you watch Matt LaFleur make a speech, he doesn't seem to be necessarily rousing the, the, the group. And I don't exactly know what this means. Until, like, what are their personality differences? I don't know. You know, Kurt Banker, probably a little bit more laid back, kind of whatever. And Matt LaFleur is a, I don't know, all business, kind of serious, more, you know, not one of the guys kind of people, probably. I don't know. But again, I, I just, I, I find it kind of silly and petty to come out and, and I mean, it's it's one thing to start it off and say, listen, schematically, I'm not a big fan. And I'm sure that has a lot to do with what he was talking about in the meeting room. He would speak up and talk about it. And Matt LaFleur would probably not like that kind of input, which is what he was talking about before when he was like, you know, I had to speak up. That's what you're supposed to do. So it's one thing to say, I wasn't a fan of the scheme. I said as much and our personalities are very opposite, but no ill will and just left it at that. But then to end it with, I wasn't cut because of my play. I was playing really good. He cut me because he didn't like me. It's just like, okay, dude, whatever. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I don't know. Ne neither do you. But yeah, no, I, I, I don't think the team is suffering because we lost Kurt Bankert.
But it, it is worth exploring the first part. Again, the, the, the pettiness afterwards, I don't care about. But the first part does, is relevant. And, and it's something that I'm just, I'm, I'm not going to dive headfirst into it. Because again, a lot of people want to overreact to a game where it seemed like nobody was open. Whereas again, prior to this, you know, JT O'Sullivan, et cetera, et cetera. Man, Matt LaFleur, he's looking so good. His scheme is amazing. He's brilliant. Blah, 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 blah. But it is worth noting as we go along, just take that, put it in your back pocket. Scheme is outdated. People know how to play it. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll see as we go along how this goes. Something else, completely different subject, but I, I wanted to play this for you also. And it kind of goes to what I had mentioned prior to when people are upset about the offensive line, right? Our offensive line is not good enough. Well, two weeks ago, it was a disaster. And it's like, I don't know what happened. I can't tell you, but there's every reason to believe they're going to bounce back. They did have an improved week, but it still wasn't good enough. And I, and I said, but th- it, it's not necessarily the offensive linemen, right? The two interior guys, not including Elton Jenkins, the other two, blocked really well. Zach Tom was okay. Rashid wasn't great, but I think he gave up like his two pressures or something. It wasn't catastrophic. So where's the disconnect? If, if the offensive line wasn't terrible, why was it? Why were there so many pressures? Here's Mike Wall. I've always said, if you can't dance, don't come to the party. So if you've got tight ends, rookie tight ends, to try to block a potential defensive player of the year, if that's your plan, I think your plan sucks. I don't know if that was their plan, but if if your plan is to say, Luke Musgrave, Tucker Craft, I want you to block the defensive potential defensive player. In my opinion, that one of the toughest guys to block in the National Football League. I don't think that's a great plan. Okay, I'm not saying you're not going to block him. I'm saying you're not going to block him very often. This guy was an absolute nightmare all night. It wasn't just in the past game. I think he had one sack, four tackles for loss. I don't know how many pressures, but just when you talk about a disruptive player, this is some next level stuff here. And he's play. He's showing a player and right you now. You can just tell he's watching film, man. Of him beating Luke Musgrave to the inside and blowing up our run play. Right? So again, what we're seeing all day long is Max Crosby in the backfield, 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 backfield. And it's like this freaking offensive line. And again, we have this thing where we pick a thing that we don't like. Joe Barry, Matt LaFleur, Josh Myers, whatever. We pick a thing we don't like and we just hammer it. Offensive line. Well, freaking offensive line. There was clearly a problem, but for me, I'm not putting it on offensive line. I'm looking at this going, why in the F do we have so many guys flying off the edge unblocked? Why do we have tight ends that are trying to block off the edge? Why do we have tight ends coming across the formation trying to block? Why do we have guards coming across the formation trying to block? Why can't we just put a tackle in his face, maybe chip with a tight end, and just block the guy? Because every time we try to get cutesy... It's not working. So why are we getting effing cutesy with it? I mean, it, it, it's it's almost hilarious because we come out in this particular package and many other times with three tight ends, like we're big and bad and strong. Like We got three tight ends. And at the end of the day, what do we have? We have Max Crosby, as he said, which I agree, certainly one of the most underrated pass rushers. Maybe not as much anymore, but he has been for many years one of the more underrated, maybe one of the best, if not the best, pass rushers in the NFL. Has been for a long time, by the way. Um, lined up against Luke freaking Musgrave. This isn't some kind of power package. This is bull crap. This is soft, weak garbage. A tight end on, an, on, on, on a premier edge rusher? There's nothing big and bulky and, and bad about that. You're making yourself weak and soft. You're trying to be strong, you're trying to be cute, and it backfires because, again, you got a guy lined out wide against your tight ends, and he just beats them because Luke Musgrave isn't a blocker. He's so far from a tackle, it's a joke. I mean, our tackles, Rashid Walker would struggle. Zach Tom, heck, David Bakhtiari would have a hard time. He'd handle them, but he'd have a hard time against Max Crosby. Luke freaking Musgrave? Come on, man. You know, and, and again, this is the this is the cutesy crap, man. And it's similar to what we say about Joe Barry when he has Preston Smith on Devontae Adams. Like, well, sometimes, you know, it's just the play call and it's this and it's that and da 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 
Well, listen, then then your plan coming into the game was stupid. Your play call was stupid. Your your inability to make adjustments sucks. Your your inability to change the play on the fly and to be able to identify problems right now and either call a timeout or make an adjustment right there or do something, something has to change. We can't just keep making stupid excuses like, well, I mean, that's just how it goes. Sometimes, you know, tight ends have to block and da 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 no, sometimes you don't have to do that. Sometimes you can do something else. I, you know, I don't know. And, and, and again, what did we do? We ran that direction. We ran at the matchup that is Max Crosby and a tight end. Could that have been something we changed? Could we make a check at the line? Could we do something? Can we do anything to change anything? And, and you don't want to run the other direction because that's where it's heavy, right? He was on the weak side. So you still want to run to the weak side, but now you got... Again, the whole thing is stupid. It only works if you have a strong tight end that can handle that. Yeah, it's the weak side, but it's not really weak when it's Max Crosby on Luke Musgrave. That's not so weak. You know, or, or, or have the, the, the tackle help a little bit. Throw a hand in there. Throw a shoulder. Throw an elbow. It is, I mean, I, I, again... The thing that I said last week that feels incredibly true is the simple reality that it just it felt like our team is stupid. That's the part that sucks. You know, you, you want to be excited about the fact that it's kind of a modern offense and a modern defense and they're on the cutting edge and all this stuff. And Jordan seems really intelligent as a quarterback and just all these cool things. You know, we got a really super intelligent wide receiver and all these really intelligent pieces all over the place. And you watch the game, and it's like, you guys are stupid. Like, that's crazy. That's really crazy how stupid this is. Like, you look dumb. Like, when you have people up there with their little crayons drawn on the TV, you know, drawing circles around Preston with Devontae and just laughing, they're just chuckling. You know, they throw a slant pass for a touchdown, and they draw a circle around the guy that's too far back and just say, yeah, that was impossible. He was never going to stop that, and they just start chuckling. It's like, I know, right? We're so stupid. <laughs> Shut up. But it's true. We just, we look stupid. We look stupid. And um, we got to stop looking so stupid, you know? Let's just, let's just, let's just back up. Let's just calm down. Let's just do basic stuff. You know, again, we ran the ball fairly well. That's pretty basic. Give it to the guy and, and run. You guys up front, push. Can you freaking please push? That'd be great if you could just push. Do me that favor. And again, they, they weren't terrible in blocking. It wasn't great, but it wasn't terrible. Just mano y mano. Line them up. One to one. Good to go. They're doing their job. Not every time. But not terrible. The, the biggest disaster was all the schematic nonsense. They ran circles around us, offensively and defensively, and it's a bad football team with a stupid coaching staff. The Raiders, they're a joke. The Raiders are a joke. Organizationally, they're a joke. Their head coach has always been a joke. Yeah, he came from Bill Belichick and all that. He's a goofball. He's a freaking goofball. I mean, give me a break, man. They just happen to be schematically lined up in a beneficial situation as opposed to us. We're, we're, we're starting off in a suboptimal situation. This is what I've been saying about Joe Barry, and now we're seeing it on the offense with Matt LaFleur. And then we expect our guys to execute. Well, if you would have just executed, well, that's true. If, if Luke Musgrave would have just done his job, everything would have been fine. But also, you're stupid. You're right, but you're an idiot at the exact same time. It's amazing, isn't it? You're right. It's the same with the defense. Well, if they would just execute, you're right. If they would just execute. They're, they're being put in a very difficult situation to execute. But yeah, I mean, if they could have just done superhuman things, it'd be great. Yeah, then they can just win and everything. You know, if we just win all our matchups all the time, even suboptimal ones like Musgrave against Max Crosby, yeah, dude, we'll dominate. We'll kill everybody. If we could have our right tackle go uh, wall off their linebacker, you know, just just run ten yards and 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 not only be able to catch a linebacker who's taken off, but get to him and block him. If we could just do that, oh yeah, it'd be a piece of cake. It's stupid. He's never gonna get there. He's never gonna get there. Just doing stupid stuff. We're asking our guys to do impossible things, and then what? We 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 get in the film room and say, "Oh, your job is to do this," and you didn't do it. Yeah, stupid because nobody could do that. 
Why would you draw this up like this? This sucks. This place sucks. <sighs> I don't know. I don't I don't want to be an embarrassment. Can we can we lower the standard a little bit and just get back to where it was like, you know, we need some pieces. We need some help. We maybe need a new coordinator. We need some, I don't know, safeties. We need like a tackle, maybe an interior guy. We might need a quarterback, which is scary, but we could talk about it. We maybe need a number one wide receiver. I'm not sure. Like, you know, we could talk about these things. I don't want to be a freaking joke. And right now, what we saw against the Raiders was a joke. Offense, defense, especially offense, but it's a joke. It's an embarrassment. So that would be great if we could just not do that again. And, and the Denver Broncos are a blessing and or a curse. It's one or the other. It's either going to be a blessing or a curse. So it wouldn't be and or, it would be or. It's a blessing if they can get back on their feet and show that they're not an embarrassment and they're a good team and they can win and they can score a lot of points and the defense can do stuff. That would be great. It's a good opportunity to win a game. It's a freaking curse if you lose that game because then you're done. You're cooked. It's over. You lose coming out of a bye against the Denver freaking Broncos. You just suck, dude. <laughs> That's all there is to it. So figure it out. Stop doing stupid crap. Stop getting cute. Someday we can try to get cute. Maybe someday we'll try to get cute. I don't think there's ever a time where I want to get cute in terms of like, you know, Preston on Devontae type stuff or like, uh, you know, Musgrave on Max Crosby. Try to avoid those situations as much as possible, especially like in critical third down. By the way, if you're going to have Preston on Devontae, try not to, you know, blitz everybody so that you have to have like man freaking coverage out there, you know. Try to try to mitigate the damage that is certainly going to be done. <sighs> Anyways, I think that's it. That's all I got to say. You guys have a good rest of your day. I will talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye bye. Mmm, the first taste of rare bourbon you finally got your hands on. That's nice. At Caskers.com, we make this experience easy. Caskers is a one-stop spirit curator with an impressive selection of exclusive sought-after rare and household names in the realm of premium spirits and champagne. Discover the top flavors of the year now by going to Caskers.com and using code WELCOME10 for $10 off your first purchase. Get $10 off your first purchase with code WELCOME10 at Caskers.com.